Hi, guys. Today, we have the pleasure of chatting with a lifelong martial artist. He has been exposed to a plethora of martial arts systems garnering black belt Sifu level in arts, such as Ji Young Silam Fatgar, Young Style Tai Ji, and Sui Jiao, just to name a few. His early introduction into the fighting arts served well as a stepping stone into founding the Kung Fu Club at UCLA while earning his undergraduate degree in East Asian studies. He eventually earned his doctorate in traditional Chinese medicine. He has also learned the Pavel Satsulin method and has enabled him to work with numerous Olympic and professional athletes. Please welcome today, Dr. Mark Chen. How are you doing today, sir? Good. Thank you, Sifu. Good to meet you. Yes, yes. It is a very, very big pleasure to, act, to actually be speaking with you face to face. Well, it's not face to face, but you know what I mean, though, Sifu. Close enough. So let's not waste any of your time. I know you're an extremely busy man. So let's go straight into the interview. If you sure. don't mind me asking, how did you start the martial arts, doctor? Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, get a little bit of an introduction from my father. Um, my father taught me just very basic kicks and punches when I was a little kid. Uh, kicks, punch, block, just sort of self-defense kind of stuff. And then it wasn't until I was around 10 that he started teaching me Tai Chi. Um, and so my father was actually my very first Tai Chi teacher. Um, and a uh, very interesting story with that. I remember, you know, I was around 10 at the time and uh, I was watching him practice and just watching him move in slow motion. And I thought, man, this is like, you know, not what a little kid conceives of as martial art. So as I was watching him train, I just thought that was the funniest looking thing. And so, you know, a little kid trying to suppress a laugh is just a lost cause. So I'm trying to suppress this laugh. I'm watching him and it just starts snickering. And then my dad said, what's so funny? And I said, like, that looks really funny. And he goes, this is martial art. And I thought that was even funnier. So I totally lost it. And so he had me throw a punch. I threw a punch and he just like deflected it super softly and redirected it and launched me across the room. And not in a way that was violent or harsh or like painful, but just like felt like, how did he do that? And I remember flying through the air and thought like, as I was flying through the air, thinking I got to learn this stuff. So that, that was kind of my intro to, to martial arts. And then since then, I've been really lucky. Um, Having relocated out to Los Angeles um, at the age of 18, uh, I was fortunate enough to study with um, kind of the who's who. I mean, as you know, L.A. is one of the meccas um, of martial arts in the world. So I, mean, I was fortunate enough to study directly with um, Shotokan great Tsutomo Oshima, with um, Bruce Lee student Daniel Lee, Professor Daniel Lee, the late Daniel Lee, who uh, also taught me Yang style Tai Chi and uh, was my first Wing Chun teacher. Um, studied, uh, later on studied Sui Jiao with my first teacher, um, Dr. Daniel Wung, who's teaching, um, up in San Jose state. Uh, I think he's still teaching up in San Jose state. Um, so yeah, and, uh, was fortunate enough to, um, also, uh, through the AAU Chinese martial arts program, uh, meet Sifu Andy Ching and his teacher, uh, Grandmaster Arthur Lee, um, in Fatka. So that's how I got into that system as well. All right, all right. As you just listed off a plethora of martial arts, Sifu, you are definitely multifaceted in the martial arts scene. So my question to you then, Sifu, is what is Ji Yong Silom Fatgar? Uh, the Ji Yong, so Fatgar literally means in Chinese, Fat in Cantonese means Buddha, referring to anything Buddha or Buddhist, Ga meaning style or house. So arguably any of the Shaolin arts could, could use the term Fatka or as a, a Buddhist style um, or any Shaolin derived or Buddhist derived styles can also use, can claim that. Uh, but the Jiung style, the style of Fatka or style of martial arts practiced by the Jiung school um, is one that um, calls itself Fatka and uh, derives ancestry from Southern styles. So in the Jiung style of Fatka, there's there are five lineages, Choi Hong Lao Le Mok. Those are the five main family styles that came together to create what is known as our Fatka, as our Kung Fu. 
So you'll see movements that look very Choi Le Fat style. You'll see movements that look very Hong Kong style um, and other stuff as well. So it, it it's an archetypical Southern style of Chinese martial arts, blending slow and fast, hard and soft, high stances, low stances, um, and, you know, very simple weaponry. Okay, okay. Um, you... You took the words right out of my mouth, doctor, because I was just about to ask if it had any similarity to like uh, Chole Fat or such. And you already answered it before I even asked it. All right. <laughs> so I do have a question, though. Right. Of course. Included in the plethora of martial arts that you have experience in, you also have experience in weapon martial arts like um, Filipino Kali and Thai Krabi Krabong. No. Yes. Was it hard for you to learn these styles, seeing as how normally there's a plethora of weapon, weaponry already in Kung Fu, seeing as how you have so much experience, extensive experience with Kung Fu? Um, being able to manipulate the weapons wasn't hard or isn't so hard. What's difficult in, uh, at first for, I think, people who have a, a, an extensive forms background is doing partner drills, like noting that they have to move in time with a partner. So one of the things that's most beautiful, I think, about Filipino Kali, especially um, in the Inosanto method um, that I'm privileged to learn directly under Guru Dan Inosano, is that um, a lot of the things that we do are from day one. Like this is someone actually feeding you a strike or feeding you a, a some sort of attack. How do you deal with it and do, deal with it in a, in a a pre-choreographed motion and then taking that pre-choreographed motion and then putting it into a drill format. And then as you're training those drill formats, then breaking in and out of the drill so that you throw out the drill and it go grows closer and closer and it moves closer and closer to live sparring. So being a forms person, like you might be able to do movements, great, but to be able to do those movements within the context of someone feeding you a weapon like unless you do a lot of two-man sets um and you also vary or syncopate the rhythms in those two-man sets a lot and break out or break down those two-man sets into drills it i think the average or even the above average kung fu person um will still have a little bit of a time that they need to on-ramp themselves into kali um, Kali, I think, is really like kind of the, the Rosetta so Stone in a lot of ways. It, it helps you understand all the movements that you do in Kung Fu or in, you know, forms-based martial arts so that, you know, ah, okay, I'm doing this. And then it's like, I can understand why I might be doing this and then doing these particular movements and how they apply in fighting rather than just, I'm doing stuff that's like artistic and I don't really know. Good. Good. So, uh, learning... Filipino Kali and Krabi Kerbong can serve um, to, to, to heighten your Kung Fu in the sense of you are learning something that you're not in Kung Fu in terms of uh, the feel of the weapon, right? the actual, the way that you have to use the weapon itself, no? I would phrase it slightly differently. I would say that okay. I think, um, I think Kali and Krabi Kerbong, because they're both very applied martial arts, they're not, they're not, very forms heavy, at least the versions that I've been privy to, that I've been lucky enough to learn. Um, because so much of it is applied. So much of it is like, you know, you're working with a live partner, you're you're coming at them, you're attacking them, or they're attacking you. Um you you really have to learn not so much that like, okay, how do I move the weapon, but how do I time, how do I position myself? What's the mindset I need as someone's attacking rather than like, I've got to do this form and look in this direction and I go look over there and do this. It, it, there, there's a different kind of responsiveness and aliveness that, that happens when you're working with a live partner. Now, it's not to say that it, it, it teaches, Kali or Kabi Kabong teach you how to use your weapon. They, they, I mean, you are learning the coordination of how to manipulate your weapon already, even in doing forms. But to be able to apply that in a live setting, right? It's almost like I can read a book, but, or like I can maybe read, a, read the words in a book, but I may not know how to read those words or say those words or apply those words in a conversation with someone, right? Like I can read Spanish wonderfully, right? To actually speak Spanish fluently, reactively, like intelligently with a person, 
is a totally different thing. And like my Spanish right now is very rusty. So you get the idea. I understand. So you're getting the realness from the Krabi Cabrong and the Kali that you're just not getting from the uh, from a form based martial art to say. If you're only doing forms and you're not breaking those forms down into component parts, like I think this is one of the things that um, my late Sifu, the Grandmaster Arthur Lee, did really well. Like he would take, and this would drive people nuts, especially people that didn't understand what he was doing. He would take like two or three moves out of a form and drill that the whole night. So like you're working those techniques. You're working that like, like, one rep after another, after another, after another, and, and against different opponents or against different attacks or di against different timings. So if you don't like drill that, that idea or that, or that whatever the thing is to the point where like, you know, you can hit it with consistency, then the form might be really beautiful, but you're doing quantity and not quality. So there are Sifu out there that I'm, uh, who are, I, my hats off to and like my heart you know has a lot of respect for who will take the time to break down the movements and say like okay let's drill this let's understand this let's unwrap this um and help their students kind of feel what the positioning is like and allow them like a safe space to you know learn and on-ramp themselves to be able to control them someone um, who's coming at them with aggressive or violent energy awesome but forms in and of itself like if you're only doing form and you've never tested that as far as timing, as far as distancing, as far as, um, you know, mindset preparedness. Like you, you're in for a rude surprise when someone really comes and brings it to you. Hmm. Understandable. Very, very understandable. I do get you, Sifu. So let's go ahead and move on to our next question. In sure. your honest opinion, right, seeing as we're speaking of Kung Fu and the term Kung Fu literally is skill one that is developed over a long period of time. What is your honest opinion in the hardest part of developing Kung Fu? Patience, bar none. So a lot of people want to collect knowledge. And I myself was just equal, was and sometimes still am equally as guilty of this. Um, collecting more knowledge and not having the skill to be able to contextualize that knowledge is it's like hoarding, right? Like you've seen people on the news. It's like you go into someone's house and it's like they have a room full of toilet paper. Like is toilet paper useful? Sure. It's useful, but like a whole room full of it, maybe not so much unless you're actually selling it or something like that. Right. But to have that much for yourself and like you're taking up useful space, right? And like you're not able to use it as quickly as you're accruing it, right? That that that's kind of a pathology, right? So ideally, if you have the patience to learn a few moves and then work the hell out of those moves to the point where you've got them, you know, like you've got them dialed in. You you like you know exactly what you're going to do, um, and you can apply it whatever that movement is calmly crisply cleanly like you just you've got it on lock that takes time that takes patience that takes like a certain level of internal chill in yourself and mental targeting like you know exactly what your priorities are and you're going for the right things so yeah patience if you want to be good at kung fu you want to be good at anything you want to be good at kali you want to be good at drums you want to be good at like medicine you want to be good at basketball patience i mean you look at all of the kobe bryant videos and it's like patience and dedication he's when everyone else is out partying when everyone else is out doing this when everyone else is out doing that he's got the discipline to go into the gym and do work we've got to do that too and sometimes that work sometimes that dedication sometimes that discipline isn't necessarily training harder, doing more, like I want to push harder, be more aggro. No, sometimes it's about being chill enough to calm down, slow down, sleep properly, eat properly, recover, work hard, make a living, and then do your training. Understandable. 
And all of it comes from patience. Yeah, patience, I think, you know, patience and perspective, I think both are super necessary. You can be patient and just sit on your ass and do nothing. Okay, that's got kind of patience. But like perspective helps you play the long game instead of rushing, right? Like, oh, I want to be a better fighter and I go and I'll, I'll train till I'm, I'm, I'm sore and then I'm going to train some more. Well, if you train some more past the point when you're sore, if, you're, if your technique, if your alignment, if your posture decays, or if you train yourself into injury, how intelligent is that? You know, these are questions that we need to really consider and ask. It's very true. It's very true. I understand that. I understand that. I am I definitely agree with you as well, Sifu. Patience, it is a virtue, literally. So, next question for you. How has your martial training benefit helped your professional career? Um, I would say that martial arts from a like an understanding of the workings of the human body helped me a lot because um that i, I think um being intimately acquainted with injury both in the causing of it and also the the receiving of it um i it's easier for me to understand how a lot of my patients um in the clinic have have suffered their different injuries so then also because i know how i um, either have recovered or how I've treated other people or how I've seen other people treat it, I can oftentimes use that background experience to help them recover faster. Um, so th that's one way. Um, another way it's helped me professionally, I think, is mostly from Tai Chi, like the, the go hard or go soft, go faster, go slow, like being able to have my fingers on the dimmer switch, you know, being able to change the speed or the intensity or the approach. Um, to be able to like let things slide versus always charging hard and fast. I mean, like having options rather than just one way of doing things has been really, um, really healthy, really helpful for me on a professional level. All right, all right. So learning through your through, through so your injuries and your path right through the martial arts and receiving everything has also you know, given you uh, a sort of empathy for your patients as well. You know exactly what they're going through. You know what they're feeling. Yes, that is great. That is great. That, that, that's, that's awesome, Sifu. That's awesome. So here's another question for you. Sure. If you could teach the new generation of martial artists only one thing, it could be technique, it could be philosophy, it could be both, what would it be? Honor the basics, honor the basics. Um, oftentimes, and it's speaking for myself, you know, like I'm thinking back to when I was like in my late teens, early twenties, it was all about like, oh, I want to learn, like, I want to learn all these cool techniques. I want to learn these cool forms. I'll learn like how, you know, how to fight better, how to whatever, fill in the blank. I think if I could, I'm actually pretty sure if I could rewind time and talk to myself as a kid, you know, before I came out to LA, I would say, look, you're going to have the opportunity to learn all of this stuff. Instead of focusing on how to be a better fighter, focus on learning how to master your body better in such a way that you can move more efficiently with less effort, with less strain and with faster recovery. Because as you're able to do those things, you will be in the game better longer safer smarter now these are things that i'm sure i'm quite sure my dad said to me at some point in time um it's possible that like maybe how he phrased it didn't click with me but it's probably more likely that at, at that age and time i was just too pig-headed too like full of energy that like i just didn't hear what my dad was saying and so that that the responsibility for that falls on me so I think if I could go back and tell, or even now, talk to the younger generation, I'd be like, look, some of the basics you want to overlook, like the stretching, like sitting in horse stance, like the postural stuff, like the breathing exercises, you're going to think this is bull and you're going to want to fast forward over into the fighting and the self-defense and the cool forms. But 
if you want to be able to do all those things in a sustainable fashion so that you don't suffer overuse injuries, so that you're able to turn all of those training sessions into not only learning how to do something cool athletically, but something that's rehabbing you at the same time, you will honor the basics. You will understand what are the precision points that you need to like really own so that as you are training, you aren't just exerting, but you're actually rehabbing and building your body at the same time. That is an absolutely masterful answer right there, doctor. And it really hits home with me because one of my teachers, she always used to say to me, the master is truly a master of the basics, right? Because that's where true mastery starts, from the basics. And to hear you say it, now I know it must be true. When I look back at, at some of the teachers that really wow me the most, they didn't have the flashiest technique. They had some of the simplest technique, but they could do it in a way that just seemed like, you know, like Guru Inasano says, it's like, if you have an angle one and an angle two, but you really understand that angle one and angle two, you can beat most people. And watching him just wait and then just fake a different angle one. Like I've watched him do that so many times and been like, wow, he's just, he's calling out his technique and he's just tooling other people. And so it's like, ah, okay. Now it, it's clear to me. It's clear to me. Just like take your time, work the basics, understand how that simple basic applies in a rich fashion. And you and you can do a lot with it. Understandable. Understandable. So, doctor, I'm going to ask you one more question. How sure. can you be contacted? Um, the easiest way to get a hold of me, uh, I can't always promise a reply, but the easiest way to get in touch with me or to see what I'm doing these days is usually through social media. So um, my handle is pretty much universal across the big three, Facebook, Twitter, or now X and uh, Instagram. And that's at Dr. Mark Cheng, D-R-M-A-R-K-C-H-E-N-G. And most of the time, like Insta is usually one of the easier ways to find out what I'm doing. All right, all right. Information for Dr. Mark Cheng will be in the description down below. Also in the description below will be a link for Fayu Shoes. If you need Fayu Shoes, click the link down below to get the best prices, the best deals, all at Fayu Shoes. Dr. Mark Cheng, I want to thank you very much for the time that you have taken to speak with me, sir. I am My so pleasure. honored. Just to let My everybody pleasure. know, I have been watching him since combat tai chi that was the first thing i ever saw of you and i have been reading and following you ever since that yeah actually i and i sports just re-released that series of dvds on combat tai chi so um yeah if you guys want to go to i and i sports um dot com or i sports.com i believe is the url i'm not entirely sure um you will find that combat tai chi uh instructional series of which sifu winter speaks that's absolutely awesome it's absolutely awesome you have had the absolute pleasure of training with a plethora of martial arts legends. In my book, Doctor, you are a legend. So I feel honored to have spoken with you today. Thank you very too much. Too kind. Too kind. Thank you, sir.